Hello there members, welcome and good evening. I'm Anna from the Tastings team and I am delighted to be welcoming you to our second Spanish event of the week tonight. For those of you catching up on YouTube, I do appreciate there's been a date change. Um, so apologies if you can't make the new date and join us live, but hopefully those who couldn't uh, are catching up on YouTube. So hello to you as well. Uh, we've got the lovely Mahesh behind the scenes again today, helping me out. So thank you, Mahesh. Uh, we're lucky enough to have him twice this week, so appreciate it. Uh, and he's going to be helping me with all things technical, um, but a few bits of housekeeping to help him and me along the way. Uh, if you are planning on submitting a question, we'd absolutely love you to do that. Please do so by using the Q and A. Um, that just helps us manage the questions a little bit better. I'll try and answer them as I go along. And if I can't, then hopefully we'll have some time at the end, although there is a lot to get through. Um, and then I would also encourage you, if you want to, to use the chat to let us know where you are and what you're drinking. When you do use the chat, please make sure that you select from the drop down menu everyone, because if you just select hosts and panellists, then it's only Mahesh and I that will be able to see. So please make sure like Roger and Jean just have that you select everyone. Hello, Roger and Jean from a wet York, um, but glad that you're joining us with the White Rioja tonight. So um, I think that's probably it for me. I've got some slides that I will show you throughout the course of the evening. And uh, you are welcome to have those slides because uh, there, there are lots of them are actually photos that I took on a recent trip to Rioja. So I was there in April. And that's actually what inspired me to do this particular focus on Rioja. We could have just done a focus talking about, you know, um, how, how long things age or here's a couple of soils um, from various places. But what I really noticed when I was in Rioja um, was this, this dichotomy. Um, I'm used to French vineyards, travel a lot in France um, and then sort of more emerging places like um, uh, South Africa or California. And really, Rioja was quite interesting because it has got this very, very traditional background. But there is this emergence coming through of very modern, not only in winemaking that we'll talk about, but styles of wine as well. So for me, um, that was a really interesting topic to cover. So if you are familiar with Rioja wines, I'm not hopefully going to bore you senseless, but equally at the same time, there's going to have to be some really nice basic um, introductory stuff to Rioja that we'll build on throughout the session when we start talking about uh, this modern versus traditional idea that's coming through at the moment. So without further ado, I'm going to get my slides up. Um, I would say uh, for anyone who joined us on Tuesday, you may or may not, depend, depending on how your um, how your configuration is on your screen, I might actually be covering the Rioja uh, box out, which is number 54. So I'll just show you on the map and give it a circle. La Rioja is based here. Now, it is very much in the northern and central part of Spain. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute because um, I'm just going to talk a bit more um, about that in a moment. But I wanted to show you where it was. And because if anybody's tasting the carver, I have a real soft spot for carver. Love, love, love it. It's the wine that got me into the wine trade. Uh, so I don't want to drink this warm and I hope you don't either. So I'm going to start talking about the carver because it's actually an interesting story about the modern, traditional and some new developments in the production of carver in Rioja. So please, if you have a, a carver, any carver, this carver, whatever it might be, um, please do feel free to, to get started. Um, so carver, sorry, my, um, my washing machine's on and it's clinking my bottles together downstairs. I don't think I've ever had such an aggressive washing machine. There we go. Um, so carver is a sparkling wine made in the traditional method. So made in the same way as champagne. And it is produced in many regions in Spain. And I mentioned on Tuesday's session that the Penedes is a particularly popular region. So a lot of your big, big brands are coming out of there. But there is quite a decent portion. It's not big portion, but certainly good quality carver produced in the region of Rioja. That's lovely. And it's, it's as I said, good quality, but it certainly lacks a little bit of identity. And there is really, unless you know the brand, nothing to say on the label very easily where that carver has come from. So what region is, is producing this sparkling wine? So there is a new designation and it's coming in. Uh, it's already in, actually. But I think given the aging I'm about to tell you, I think it's just rolling through now. And it's Espumoso de Rioja. 
So sparkling wine of Rioja. And it's got to be hand harvested. So this is new, new regulations, has to be hand harvested, and it's going to have new aging requirements that are more in line and in keeping with the more traditional aging requirements of Rioja. So you have to have 15 months uh, on the lease for this for this category in Crianza, 24 for Reserva, 36 for Gran Añada. So if you're 36 months on lease aging, you're starting to talk there about your your um, same lease aging levels as vintage vintage um, champagnes. So they very much sort of position themselves as mirroring in a way um, that that type of wine. And you can only have brut, extra brut or brut nature. So no dosage. And what that means for sparkling wine, when you see that on the bottle. So this is actually a brut reserva. Um, it doesn't say the Espumoso yet, but it does say brut reserva, which means brut aged. Um, it, what that means for wine is it's going to be drier in style. So. There are some styles of carva produced elsewhere that have a bit more residual sugar and that slight sweetness, sometimes balancing acidity, but this, these will all be dry in style. Um, so I've got a slide later and I'll show you where it sits, but it kind of sits outside the rest of Rioja, all of this, this um, Espumoso business. But it's really interesting. I'm going to talk about sparkling wine a few more times um, because it is very relevant to the changes that are in Rioja at the moment. So things like geography, uh, climate is really important when we talk about sparkling. So I will re-mention it. But I think the most interesting thing is there is a, a reaction, should we say, to this Espumoso de Rioja. Um, the reaction has come from the producers who wanted a better labelling, but also there's a reaction from the producers. So this particular carver is made by Muga, and I was at Muga, luckily, in April, and they were talking about uh, this Espumoso exactly. So um, they don't know yet whether they'll use it. There was still, still some discussion, but they are considering whether they'll use Espumoso. Obviously, the challenge is if you're not putting carver on your label, then people won't know what it is. So you kind of, it almost comes down to a marketing thing. Is Espumoso de Rioja, like a sparkling Rioja, going to sell more wine? Or is Carver going to sell more wine? Which, quite frankly, um, you know, between wine buffs, we all know it's an amazing wine. But between most people, um, it has a bit of a, a, a knocked reputation. So who knows? I think watch this space on the Espumoso de Rioja. Uh, it's very, very exciting. But I'm going to, in the interest, we've got four wines tonight. So I am going to quickly talk about each of these wines, um, especially as I know not everyone always tastes along. But um, this is produced, oh, pardon me. This is produced for us by Muga, who are most famous for their red wines. They are based in the Har Aro district. So the beautiful old railway station, if anyone's visited. Big company, but they do produce red, rosé, white and sparkling wines. And for those of you who caught the 2018 vintage, that's the one I have. Uh, the blends for the 2018 and 2019 are relatively similar. But uh, what I would say is, bear in mind, members, the 2018 just won our wine champions blind tasting, right? Um, the 2018 was considered a good vintage by the Consejo de Rioja. So the people who sort of stamp the stamps and seal the seals and uh, et cetera. The 2019 vintage, which, which we just got in, is rated officially excellent. And the difference between the two is that uh, even though they're the same blend of grapes, so about 70% Viura, 30% Chardonnay, the um, 2018 that I have, that vintage had quite a lot of rain. So the grapes were a little more swollen, slightly more dilute, uh, producing a lighter style of wine. Still good quality, but not excellent quality. The way that Muga described this vintage in 2019, sorry, this wine in 2019 vintage, which I'm irked to not have them side by side, but I should be so lucky, um, was that it was so brilliant that there was not much left to do. They gave, his, the exact words I think David used were they gave respect to nature. Um, it's a, the 2019 is a fuller wine, it's rounder, um, it's more rich, and the 18 is slightly more refreshing. So what does that mean? Well, it depends when you drink your wines, but I would say the 2018, if you've got some, is probably more your aperitif wine. The 2019 sounds to me like it might be really good with food. Now, it didn't go into our wine champs, but I think unless we buy it all <laughs> between now and then, which we might do, members, unless we buy it all, I would imagine that the 2019 will win champs next year as well. So having a quick taste, it's got really traditional carver, carver aromas. This is a really classic style of carver. So apple, uh, much more on the apple and kind of 
uh, peachy, slightly nutty. Viora gives that lovely character. Chardonnay as well does bring some elegance here, which is nice, that 30%. Um, but Viora gives a great mouthfeel. Chardonnay brings the fresh freshness. Viora tends to give white fruit um, a mouthfeel, as opposed to that lemon. There's a touch of lemon from the Chardonnay. Um, I'm actually annoyed I didn't put this in a wine glass. I think it tastes better in a wine glass than a flute, particularly good carver tends to. Ooh. Mm. I mean, it's fabulous. I do understand that this is the lighter one. I totally get that. It feels slightly lighter to me than some of their other, other um, carvers I've had before, but it's definitely still that classic carver. Bright, foamy bubbles, um, more akin to champagne than Prosecco. Lovely and rich, less natural acidity than champagne. So perhaps um, sometimes a bit easier for people who find that a champagne tiny a bit too acidic, like my husband. Um, but amazing, amazing value for money, in my opinion. So hopefully, if you're tasting along, you've enjoyed it. Uh, right. So moving on from Carver, I want to quickly talk geography of Rioja. We have touched on it already, but uh, I'm going to zoom in a little. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. There are three parts of Rioja, and some of you will know these really well. Some of you may be less familiar. And I'm going to give you a nice overview, I think, on what you need to know to understand why things are changing in Rioja. So this orange bit here is Rioja Baja. Now, it changed its name because Baja means lower in, um, in Spanish. But the lower is in relation to the river, not the quality. Unfortunately, it happens to be that the quality here is less um, elegant, should we say. So it sort of became this, I don't know, it must have been a bit of a, a chip on the shoulder. So they have changed the name to Oriental, meaning easterly, uh, which I don't think is a great name. So um, I would say for me, this uh, region is, is <laughs> I continue to call it Baja. And I think that's fair. It means lower because the Ebro River that runs through it is the lower part. Here it is warmer Mediterranean climate. If we flick back to this map, uh, it sounds mad, but the Mediterranean does sweep through the river up here. Um, it's less protected. It's much flatter. So you do get this warming influence coming up. That is in contrast to the Alta and Alavesa, which are um, even though, let me show you. Even though um, there are a, there is a huge mountain range there, they are still getting influence from the Atlantic. Now, people sometimes say, oh, the Alta and the Alavesa are higher up and the altitude gives this freshness. No, there's altitude everywhere in Rioja. You can find it wherever you want. There's pockets of altitude wherever you like. Really, it's a lot to do with the sea influence. So Atlantic versus Mediterranean. This is a much warmer climate. Um, that's the reality. Because of that, uh, Tempranillo doesn't love, love the warmth as much as Garnacha does. So down in the Baja, you're tending to get more Grenache or Garnacha. And then up here in the Alta and Alavesa, you get the both. Alta and Alavesa are basically delineated between north of the river and south of the river. And they do have slightly different soil types. But again, the closer you get to the river, you can always find alluvial soils. So um, starting to sort of nitpick around uh, generalizations in Rioja can be a bit of a challenge. Um, I have got one photo that I took in, uh, and I apologize, it wasn't a photo, it's a video, so I had to screen grab it. But this was stood in the vineyards of Lopez de Heredia, who are based um, in Aro, which I should show you on the map, really. That would make sense for everyone, wouldn't it? Right in this northerly part here. So they're based in Aro. And they have vineyards. Uh, we were basically stood here. And this is what you can see, this amazing cooling mist that is coming from the ocean. So if you really didn't believe me that there was ocean influence coming from the Atlantic, um, I hope that you believe me now. <laughs> um, so I think those are the important parts when we're talking about, about the geography of Rioja and the climatic influence. And like I said, I'm going to go on to explain why that has influenced the change in Rioja in a moment. But before we do that, in fact, let's talk a little bit of history before we go on to whites. Obviously, if you're tasting the white, please feel free to start. If you're tasting any of the wines, just taste along and I will get to them, I promise. Um, but a bit of history about Rioja that I think will also help when we start to go on to how it's changing um, is uh, the, the location. The reason I've explained that geography is actually crucial to um, to the history and why Rioja has evolved 
politics, geography and tradition have really shaped why Rioja is the way it is today. Um, firstly, the wines were in, I mean, Rioja production has been here since um, uh, 1000 BC, so BC. Um, so a long, long history of production, but it, they were really popularized when pilgrims were walking with Santiago de Compostela and pilgrims would actually buy the wines of Rioja saying they were better than all the others around on the way through to St. James, the St. James's way um, to Santiago and the pilgrims would buy the wines on the way back. But traditionally, these would be big casks of wine. You just run some wine off. Um, and because then it's not near a port. So Rioja doesn't have the, the influence or the benefits of the very, very bourgeois emerging places like Bordeaux, Porto, um, the Loire Valley. These places were all close to ports. And um, Marseille bringing wines from the Rhone down. Um, it was sort of landlocked and trapped. So other than these pilgrims, there was not much uh, trade, should we say, in Rioja. But a local winemaker from Rioja visited Bordeaux and he, he saw these barrels, these much smaller barriques, and saw that they were using those to transport their wine. And he said, right, well, OK, hold on, we could do this. So suddenly they had a way to move wine. So they brought, they started producing barrels and they could ship their wines to Bilbao. The good thing about that is oak also stabilizes the wine as well as being a good travel vessel. So they could not only move the move the wines to the port and to Europe, but they could actually ship to the colonies. So I think the USA um, was the most attractive market. Obviously, the UK, too. Anywhere where demand was high and supply was low. Um, so places that weren't producing much wine but like to drink it. Always good. Um, so that's a bonus. They've started to do that. Um, and then phylloxera. Not many regions can say that phylloxera was a bonus. But as the French got absolutely, uh, French vineyards got absolutely destroyed with phylloxera, the uh, louse, the naughty louse that was ruining all the vineyards in, at the turn of the century, didn't come over the Pyrenees. Because by the time a walker had travelled over the Pyrenees, the louse had dropped off their clothes, dropped off their shoes. So it took a much longer time for Spain to actually get infected. And actually, by the time Spain was infected, they'd already worked out how to solve the problem by grafting on the roots. So um, what actually happened was a lot of Bordeaux producers said, well, let's just go to Rioja and make wine down there. We heard it's good. So you get this um, this change from big cask, easy drinking, uh, almost footfall wines for the Santiago de Compostela. And suddenly you have an influx of some of the finest winemakers in the world from Bordeaux producing small casks, shipping them out in barrels. So it's funny that we call traditional Rioja these small oak cask, um, almost Bordeaux blend-esque wines. Um, but really, that's not where Rioja started. That's that's a few hundred years old, that. The really old styles had lower levels of extraction, large oak, consumed them early. Um, but for the interest of this presentation, because we start to go into sort of new wave and it gets a bit complicated, what, we'll, what we're going to compare today is that small oak cask, and we'll call that traditional because that's what we all consider as, as modern day drinkers as traditional, to modern style. So what's the emerging style of Rioja? Um, but that modern, that that tradi um, sorry, that modern, that traditional style, that is really an influence of Bordeaux, a requirement to ship and get their wines moved to other markets more easily. And also the, the, the richer style from the oak. So the fact that oak was the vessel that they were using has hugely influenced. Um, and then I suppose the last really important thing actually to talk about is Franco. Um, because Franco has, has shaped the layout, the landscape, should we say, of how the industry works in Rioja. There are actually smaller amount of wineries and lots and lots of growers because um, it was very hard to invest in, in oak casks. People with big wallets could get into the market easily and they rose to the top. Um, so they would buy in grapes from growers and growers didn't want to take the risk in the Franco era, um, you know, to put their capital up um, when it was much easier for them to get a steady income. So you have this sort of pyramid situation with a what is what is true now is around 500 wineries in Rioja, but about 11 and a half thousand growers. So it's a similar structure to that of Champagne. You have a lot of big houses. It's cash heavy to get in. So you have a lot of big houses managing a lot of growers. Now, 
the the really good comparison to champagne is that it's changing and what we call growers champagne are now emerging and hopefully through the course of this presentation you'll see that there's almost this growers rioca surgeons i've coined that term and it's not very pretty but um <laughs> just come up with it now but you'll hopefully try uh, i'll try and explain that a bit more as we go through but this sort of top down pyramid there's nothing wrong with it some of the finest wines are made in this way all of these uh, producers that we're tasting tonight do buy in some grapes to a greater or lesser extent. And I would call none of the actual uh, wineries themselves these sort of emerging small, small guys, although some are making styles. Um, and to give you one final stat to put it in perspective, if you imagine that pyramid, there is somebody with a huge slice of the pyramid, which is Campo Viejo, and they own about 11%. Of, or own or buying grapes from around 11% of the whole region. So it gives you an idea. The big guys do have a lot of um, weight. Um, I've had a comment from somebody saying that there is a great cooperage in Muga. I feel ashamed. Mahesh has just sent me a message saying you have a picture, don't you? Yes, I visited the cooperage. Um, I uh, visited the cooperage at Muga and Vina, Vina de Tondodia. Um, um, or Lopez de Heredia, rather, I should say. And I didn't put any in because um, I've got some other pictures of the cooperage, but not the barrels coming in in a bit. So I will show you that uh, when we talk about really traditional methods of production. But amazing if you get a chance to visit Muga. It's it's beautiful and the cooperage is cool. So let's go on to the white wines. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, I've had a very quick question from James as well, just asking whether why the, the Wine Society don't declare the 30% the 30 Chardonnay on the TWS notes. Um, my honest answer is I don't know. I can ask for you. Uh, they're notes that I made when I was visiting. Um, so I hope I haven't lied to you. <laughs> but I think it is 30% Chardonnay. I'll double check that for you, uh, James, but I'm almost certain that it is. So um, let's try the white wine. The reason I included this white wine, I've included the next two wines from the same producer. And that's because I, I wanted to use four wines because I wanted to do a side by side red. I wanted to show a white and I wanted to show a sparkling. But I was also conscious that we didn't have too much time. So uh, this wine and the following wine, the El Pacto, are made by the same fam group, family group. That's terrible English <laughs> group of, of wineries. So um, I won't dwell on I won't dwell on them too much in both instances. I'll move on quite quickly. But they are um, a wonderful group called Vinete and they produce what's beautiful about their proposition is they don't stick. And this is where I think it's a perfect company for explaining the modern and the traditional. They don't believe that the two can't coexist. So we're going to have one of their traditional style white wines, followed by one of their more modern style red wines. And I think that that's lovely. They're from two different labels. They've got an even more traditional label, which is um, is very cool. I think we've got their rosé at the moment. I'll mention it in a minute and maybe Mahesh might be able to find uh, Lopez de Jaro's rosé on the website. It's very unique. Um, so they have almost like very, very, very traditional with that label. Then they move on to uh, their, their sort of tr more traditional wines, like the one they make for us in the White Rioja, and then they swing all the way through to the modern. So they're a really good example company. And we did an event with them recently. Uh, and in the follow up email, I'll send a link to that because it's fascinating. Um, but white wine in Rioja is, is very traditional. Um, we see a lot more of it on the market now, but it's been around forever. And it's been around in a range of styles. I would say the most traditional, interesting um, Rioja is a, um, it's called the Monopole Classico, also made by Cune. Oh, we didn't have a Cune wine today, uh, but it's made by Cune and it's got sherry in the blend. So it's 85% Viura and 15% Manzanilla. Ah, oh, Mahesh has just said the rosé is out of stock. Um, sorry about that. It is very special, but it's tiny quantities. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, uh, you know, there are, there was a, an old tradition to make this sort of nutty um, style, uh, the, the letter that they found that said they were mixing sherry in the blend to get it extra salty and extra nutty came from the 60s or 70s. So that was the kind of old school way. There is still um, a tradition, should we say, to make an oaky style of wine. 
Um, but the viewer itself will bring you this lovely nuttiness if you let it age in a barrel. Now, this actually hasn't been aged too long. So this is a two year old wine, um, the 2020. But it has had 30 percent oak and it's had French oak and it does enhance and exacerbate that golden colour and that nutty richness. So I think that's fabulous. Um, it is mostly uh, Viura, a touch of Malvasia. And the other thing that they do to this to add the richness and the texture is they do stir in some batonnage. So, um, oh, somebody said the Wine Society uh, White Rioja is their house white. Do you know what? When the, when the weather turns, i.e. sort of September time, it's our house white here too. It really is. I think it goes with everything. Roast chicken, fish pie, especially if there's a bit of nutmeg, because I get a bit of nutmeg in here. I think for you for money, you can really get much better than this. Um, and yes, someone's mentioned the white alpacto is also nutty rich with good acidity. The difference between the white alpacto and this wine is I would say that this is more kind of oaked forward. Uh, the alpacto is slightly older. So the nuttiness is coming from the old grapes. Um, it's a little bit less um, handled, I would say. But remember, they come from the same producer. So there is definitely a, a, a touch of something shared. Um, one thing I was going to mention as well is this producer is moving up the mountains with their vineyards. I mentioned earlier I would come back to geography. Getting the altitude, um, they've actually started planting vines at 800 metres, which is just on the edge. They've planted just outside of the Rioja Appalachian um, or oh, the Denomination because they do see that the um, it used to be very traditional to plant on the valley floors because you wanted to get these rich wines. And, and these wines are actually not from the highest of altitudes. I think they're about 400 metres, but I need to check my notes. Um, but they are recognising that you need to move up, get those higher altitudes, especially for your white wines. So um, you can kind of see here. I mean, all of this is still a decent above sea level. Rioja is on quite a high plateau. But all of the vineyards, they're really starting to try and find those spots because as the as the um, summers get warmer, maintaining the acidity in the whites is going to be crucial. And I showed a few people this picture on Tuesday, who, if any of you were there. Um, they are the most incredible soils as you move into this part of Rioja. So this is the, um, they are in Alavesa and they have these beautiful sort of limestone chalky soils. It does mean that they look very bare. Um, Pedro here explained to me how hard it is to grow. Uh, it's so sunny and it's sort of warm, but with a cool breeze. You know, it's sort of hot intense sun but with this lovely cool breeze I mean um, you know we were in in long sleeves but it's very hard with those conditions to grow things like cover crops so it can look quite sparse in Rioja um, but it's, it's certainly not it's absolutely beautiful um, right let's taste it and then I'm going to go on to a scary slide <laughs> um, so yeah nutty it's it's um what's the fruit I'm looking for it's not a kumquat It'll come to me, but it's definitely there's white fruits, stone fruits. It's less lemony. It's more um, green apple, yellow apple kind of thing. Um, not tropical per se, um, but there is that kind of lovely sweetness as well coming from the oak. Um, not quite vanilla, but I think I mentioned nutmeg earlier. I always get nutmeg on this one. So I'm going to have a taste. Mm. Mm. So you can tell from that batonnage, that 30% oak, it's a, it's really quite rich on the mouthfeel. Um, I think that batonnage is already always, ooh, that's also added that saltiness, that lovely finish. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I love it with food. It's got that nice salinity. Um, you know, if you compared this next to a very heavily um, American oak sort of where the oak is vanilla style Chardonnay, I think. The Riochan traditional style is certainly to go more on the savoury push rather than the sweet push in their white wines. And personally, I think that's what makes them so food friendly. They are rich. They are intense. Um, I tend not to drink that wine as much in the summer. It's definitely for me an autumn, an autumn and winter wine. It works beautifully with things like roast turkey. Um, so if you really wanted to go for it, <clears throat> I think that would be a good a good one. Um, so let's. This is where things are going to get. Sorry, I didn't realise I was still sharing. Let's go on to 
scary slide. Got a few questions. Um, I've got a few questions in the chat about Carver and White Rock, so I might just cover those quickly. Um, the, uh, in fact, I've got a couple of questions. I'll be very quick. Um, modern versus traditional mapping it to Carver and then to White Rioja. So modern traditional in Carver is the, is the challenging one because essentially nobody knows at the moment exactly what's going to happen with these new regulations. It depends whether people are going to want to choose to use them or not use them. There is a, uh, so the push is between whether you're going to say that you're Espumoso and what that ends up looking like or whether you say you're Carver. Because there is such variation in Carver, because essentially it's not, um, there are regulations, but it's it's more akin, it's more associated with the method of production. It's not regionally designated, et cetera. Um, whereas Espumoso, in fact, I have an amazing link. Uh, do I have it to hand? Yes, I've probably still got it open. I'm going to pop the link in. In fact, I'm not going to pop it in the chat. That would be mad. Um, but there's a drinks business article on Rioja's new rules. Um, I will put it into the um, follow up email. But the new rules around Espumoso and what that looks like mean that it should, in theory, move to a, a really top quality and less, would I call it rustic? It's a word I don't love to use. But I think the quality will make it more elegant, more refined. And I think Espumoso might end up being the new modern version of Carva. But we just don't know. And then in terms of White Rioja, I didn't really finish. I've explained what the traditional is, but I haven't really explained what the modern is. The modern is quite pared back. And actually, Muga make quite a modern uh, Rioja. Less oak, allowing Viura to shine much more on your summer wines. And um, sometimes a bit more, um, sometimes a bit more Malvesia which is um, is a bit lighter, fresher. So they're definitely making more sort of summer, summer sipping white wines than gastro wines, um, which absolutely have a time and a place. I tend to be a bit of a sucker for these wines, and I know not everybody does like them, these, these traditional rich, nutty ones. But for me, they're fantastic. And to be honest, I haven't found my perfect modern white Rioja um, in that kind of less oaked, less nutty, less, um, you know, more floral style and less sort of dense. When I do, I could quite happily probably drink white Rioja all year round. Um, somebody's mentioned El Pacto. El Pacto is a um, El Pacto is a fantastic modern Rioja. It's just not my everyday price range. I think it's about eighteen pounds. Um, so it's not a wine that I can drink every day. Whereas the Muga wine, I have to say, was was a really nice, um, yeah, was a really nice entry or everyday uh, wine. Quickly on Macabeo versus Viura, they are the same great variety. So Peter's asked, the wine society seems to use them interchangeably. Um, Macabeo is, it depends where you are in Spain, basically. So same great variety. And uh, I will, um, final question on oak before we move on. Somebody's asked, uh, does US oak figure in both modern and traditional Riocas? What made the US oak so in Rioja so prevalent? Uh, so oak use of both species is, is uh, well, I say both. We're about to go into a wine that has three different types of oak in it um, or three different countries of oak in it. But American features in modern and traditional. And I think you'd be um, too generalizing if you said that American was traditional and French is modern, although arguably that is the norm. Um, French oak tends to have that more vanilla coconut um, flavour to it. And that's really what you get on those lovely, uh, almost bounty bar, traditional red riocas. What I would say is the reason they were using American oak is because the French obviously didn't want to sell them oak uh, and there were trade wars with Franco and it was much easier for them to do trade in America and buy their oak from America. <clears throat> Subsequently, because of that good relationship, the oak is actually cheaper for them in America. But that's not a quality problem. It doesn't mean that the cheaper oak is better or sorry, is lesser quality, but they are. Um, it is cheaper, but it definitely creates a more overt style. Depends how you toast it. And most producers now, like I say, are making a mix or a lot of them are. If you find that a producer is sticking to American oak, that is sticking to tradition. Uh, but I don't like saying that one is one and one is the other because there are some amazing modern style riocas. We're about to have one that has a touch of American oak in it as well. It's more about the recipe than it is about, you know, swiping that one is one is old and one is new. That was a bit of a rubbish answer, but I hope I hope I explained myself somewhat. On the 
uh, note of oak, should we say. Um, this is a scary slide. Please don't worry. I'm going to hopefully whip through it. I will send it to you. Do not worry if you can't read the, pic uh, the pictures. I'm just going to quickly demonstrate. Um, in fact, nobody could read that text even if they wanted to. This is the lovely, complicated new world of Rioja labelling. <laughs> um, so we've got, I mentioned at the beginning, I'd show you a slide where the sparkling wines pop up again. We've got the quality sparkling wines. We've got the generic, so your entry level, your reserva, so your aged, like we've just tasted, and the Grania Adana, which I mentioned, the 36 months. So that's more uh, looking on your very premium vintage champagne style. You may be familiar and hopefully may have spotted and can turn any bottle of Rioja over to spot this lovely um, shiny, shiny label. Now, um, this is an interesting one actually to talk about shiny, shiny label. So um, these four pillars are the aging um, regulations. These have been around forever and a year. And traditionally Rioja was, um, the aging was so important because your best grapes went into the long aging and it comes back to that tradition of having to find markets such as America and wanting the wines to keep and therefore keeping them in the barrel and all of this very um, traditional, the wine will stabilize in barrel and we'll, we'll taste what stabilized wine tastes like when it's barrel stabilized at the end. Um, but essentially you've got generic wines, Crianza, Reserva and Gran Reserva. I'm not going to bore you with all of the numbers. If you really want them, I will send them. In fact, I will send them in the email. But they have different months and years. Some uh, so generic has the least time in um, sorry, least time in bottle, and doesn't actually need any time in barrel. And that goes right up to Grand Reserva, which I think is two years. Sorry, three years bottle, three years barrel, two years bottle before it can be released. So um, and the the bits in the middle are in the middle. So one and one and two and one. Um, what is that is the traditional way that we would label Rioja and that is how you would sort of historically have looked for quality your grand reservas would have been your best quality because those are the um those are the ones that had the most intense fruit because they needed to age the longest however they have recognized in Rioja the Consejo has recognized that this doesn't really give the producers much flexibility in talking about where that grape where that wine is from in theory, you could take really rubbish grapes and you could chuck them in a um, chuck them in a barrel for three years, keep them in a bottle for two years, and label them Grand Reserva and charge a lot of money for them. Now, chances are you'd only sell one of those uh, per consumer, and then they'd give up and say, "No, thank you, I don't want any more of that. That was awful." But the reality is that was that was allowed. Um, the modern trend in Rioja, and this is where hopefully everything is coming together slightly, the modern trend in Rioja is that sites are very important. So terroir, what we've heard, you know, spoken about so much in, in French viticulture, there is a, a, a move to overlay the traditional practices of ageing with something that tells you where the wine is actually from. So I, there's singular... <laughs> This is slightly annoying because the two slides I'm going to show you back to front, but hopefully it will make sense. Singular is a single vineyard site, as, as you'd expect. Municipio, sorry, that's a terrible pronunciation. Vigno de Municipio is um, from the municipal area. So um, that could be, um, actually, I've got some examples that will be easier to show you. And then Vino de Zona, so the wine from the zone. So what does that look like? Well, you've got your generic Rioja. Then you can have your zonal Rioja and then you narrow it down to your municipal Rioja and then your single vineyard Rioja. And this is what's coming through. Now, I will say not everyone is using it. And a lot of people have said, I'm not having even more labels on my wine. I'm going to make the wine I want to make and people can find out where my wine's from if they want to. But here are some examples that the Rioja board have given us about what this might look like. So your zona could just say on it Rioja Alta and I am starting to see more of these so if you remember back at the beginning the three geographical um, spots so your Baco, your Alta, your Alavesa this is um, a zona so if you've sourced all your grapes even though you might blend them but they're all from the Alta region then you can put Alta on your label if you've so sourced all your grapes, but they are from a little municipal area, so Cinecero in this case, 
you could put Vino de Senucero. You might also choose to tell people that that is in Rioja Alta. Now, especially if you're making wine in Alta and Alavesa, we've already explained that those are going to be maybe more structured with a bit more elegance because of that cooling fog and, and um, Atlantic influence I showed you. So you might say, hmm, Vino Senecero, no one's going to know what that means, where that is. Let's whack Rioja Alta on there as well. Or you might say, hey, I have got a little vineyard called Finca Carasol, and I'm going to stamp that on there and hopefully... I will make such good wine that everyone is going to want to buy the wines of the Finca Carasol vineyard. So really, we're looking at a burgundy model here. But instead of burgundy, where they just put the vineyard on, you're also going to have Rioja Alta, Vino de Sinicero, Vino de Sinicero. It's going to start to look a bit busy. Um, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to explain um, they're trying to explain where the wines come from more than they have done in the past. Now, that's not to say that we won't also have the aging. You can actually see what I mean about laying, layering it over. So um, again, just to show you another clearer example, you have the singular municipio zona wines, and then you can still have generic crianza reserva and gran reserva as well. It's going to be quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited. I think it's a really nice development. Um, Again, I'm going to send you all these slides, but I just zoomed in so that people didn't have to use their binoculars. <laughs> I will send them to you. I'm conscious of time. Um, I wanted to use uh, one example of a traditional vineyard uh, before I quickly touch on rosé and then we go on to the reds. Um, I wanted to use this example because this is a company, uh, Contino, some of you may already know their wines. I think they are amazing. And we did a lovely tasting here. But Contino was really, um, <clears throat> pardon me, Contino was really the first um, single vineyard, should we say. Um, in fact, do I want to? Yeah, let's talk about Contino. I'll talk about it quickly and then we'll, we'll um yeah, um, it was the first sort of single vineyard winery and they were borrowing the model from France. And it was started in the 1970s and nobody else was doing this in Rioja. They were all blending. They were saying we need consistency, blending adds complexity. You're absolutely mad. Now it is single vineyard, but they grow a lot of grapes and it's one big estate, but that is very rare in Rioja. And it was started by the cousin of the owner of Cune, who actually now own the whole thing. Um, it had a few commercial hiccups, including a TCA problem that meant they had to rebuild an entire winery. Um, but they do make some 100% varieties. And I don't know if you can read this as easily. Um, and obviously, I, I know um, that they all come from the Contino estate. So we don't need to necessarily. Uh, the brand is the vineyard. So we're not writing that there's a vineyard on here. But even as far back as let's see, um, can you see it? Which in, that you can definitely see on some of these. But they say. Um, they say single vineyard in English because not, the designation did not exist in Spanish. So the Contino wines have said single vineyard on them for a long time. And they've really promoted that and they've um, pushed it. And even though they're quite traditional, you can see from their labels, the mentality has been that of what's really actually driving the modern producers or the modern new wave producers, which is um, site specific. Particularly, they have this wine, Viña de Ol del Olivo, and there's a beautiful olive tree. I'm annoyed now I didn't put a picture of it in, but we don't have Contino wine to taste, so it would be cool. There's an olive tree that they've said the best, best, best stuff is under that olive tree. And so they've even singled out a few vines underneath the olive tree. Um, and the other thing they're doing is they're bottling by uh, varietal. And this is becoming increasingly popular. The single vineyard idea and the idea of terroir un as well combined with the idea of um, single varieties, so Graciano here, they do a Garnacha. This, this idea of less blending, less oak, et cetera, is um, really, really showing in Rioja. Um, so that's laws. Um, I'm conscious I was going to talk about rosé. I'll leave that until the end and then we'll whist whistle stop through it if that's all right, because I think it'd be nice to taste the reds. Um, so if whilst you're smelling, I'll kind of just address... Um, where this seismic change is coming from. So why are people changing so much? It might be a cost thing. It's, it's hard to get into these big, these big boy markets where they've, you know, need loads of barrels for the aging. Barrels are so expensive. We're talking a thousand euros a pop. Um, if you can't do that, maybe you don't want to barrel age your wine. Um, 
it, maybe it's an education thing. Third, fourth generation farmers are now wanting to drink wines from other parts of the world. And they're saying, hey, I'm drinking, uh, you know, 100 percent Cabernet from from South Australia. I want to make 100 percent wines. Um, maybe it's just a resistance against the old way. Um, maybe it's yeah, it could be all sorts of things. But what I would say is that I do, as I mentioned earlier, think that there is room for both. There are there is plenty of room for these big, big groups. Somebody out in the chat mentioned, are there cooperatives? Yes, there are. But a lot of the big groups are also just big uh, individually owned or family companies. But there are still cooperatives. Um, but there are. Yeah, I think champagne and champagne growers is a great example. You have the big houses and then you have this sort of bourgeois um, upsurging. Uh, easier to enter the market, easier to get your wines for sale more quickly, kind of experimental thing going on. And on that note, this is actually from a family winery. So they have still quite large volumes, um, but it's from a line, El Pacto, which um, produced by the same people as the white, but it's certainly in a more modern style. So I've already mentioned that they're starting to plant on more altitude. They are... Um, the last cold year in Rioja, cool year, was 2013. So they're definitely looking forward, not just for those whites, but also for the reds. So they're moving higher and higher and higher. And the other things about these sorts of winemaking are things like hygiene. So a lot of the places I visited are now cleaning their barrels with thing, with completely new technologies. They've got temperature controls, um, you know, and these are the big boys, not the up and coming small producers. Um, but this particular producer uses um, automated pump overs. So pump overs are when you move the juice onto the skins to extract tannins. And instead of doing huge, uh, when I was doing my harvest, we had, you know, a big pump over to extract lots and lots of tannins. They do it automated a couple of minutes every hour to extract really gently. And this sort of less extraction philosophy is very much in the modern, modern Rioja scene. We don't need to get the big burly wines. Um, they are also experimenting. I mentioned we we're going to taste a wine that had, uh, they, they are experimenting with 3,000 litre Austrian barrels. I don't think they're going into this wine, um, but they're also experimenting with Amphora. Um, this one is, I, we tasted it earlier in the week for anyone who joined, so you'll know already. It's, I actually lied to you. I said it was 100% Tempranillo. Actually not. There's a tiny bit of a couple of other things, but I think legally they can label it 100% Tempranillo. But if you want to be really dogmatic about it there's a couple of other bits and pieces in there old bush vines they can name the sites the vines are from so again that's really important to them they're not blending from lots of places they're blending from a really small area around son sierra which is the hilltop village um <clears throat> kind of uh, 400 to 600 um meters above sea level 70 year old vines and i can't remember all the vineyard names there's three of them um but one of them is called baños de Ebro, um which is lovely um minimal amounts of sulfites native yeasts that kind of um, modern nod to winemaking but in a really controlled manner um and it has seen 14 months in oak and i mentioned it was going to see a few countries it's got a little bit of american but french mainly and some eastern european as well but that 14 months is not all new they don't want it to inf interfere too much with the taste of the wine so they have a smell for me. This is dominated by these lovely black fruits, cherries, berries, uh, really fruity. I've had it open two days now and I have to say it smells amazing. Um, a lick of sweet spice, but it's not dominating. The colour is very fresh. It's almost like a purpley hue around the rim. Um, it's got those classic hallmark temporary tempranillo notes being slightly savoury as well. So a bit of black pepper. Um, I got a bit more kind of earthiness on the day I opened it, but um, it's definitely more on the fruit side now that it's seen a bit of oxygen for me. Mm. So considering how young this wine is, because what happens when tannins go into barrel is they soften. So what we have got are naturally lowered extracted tannins. So you, I've got like, almost sharp little grainy tannins in a really nice way. They're not softened like I suspect our next wine will be, but the levels are naturally lower. So um, they're certainly not overpowering. Lovely fresh acidity. I've got a really tart cherry thing today that I didn't have quite in the same way on Tuesday, which is lovely. Um, so hopefully if you're if you're not um, au fait with this style of, of Rioja, you will appreciate that it's 
much easier to drink for me a, a, a kind of it's a food wine it's a gastro wine but it's also got enough friendly approachability you don't have to think about it too much it's designed to be fruity and well made elegant and fruity um and it's not designed to age 20 years that's not what it's here for um i'm sure some of them do um but it's it, that's not its mo its mo is to be really delicious in the next 5 years fruity fresh stylish vibrant elegant all of those kind of words so I promised you some fun pictures of um, old old school production methods. So we've gone for the modern. We've talked about automated pump overs, but we've also talked about the people in the modern who are just small producers making single vineyards, not putting them in oak, being very gentle with them, making what they've got. Uh, traditional producers have some amazing techniques. Um, I saw mentioned uh, somebody in the chat mentioned Lopez de Heredia sellers. Uh, I've got some amazing pictures, but I didn't want to put them up because they're quite secretive about their sellers. Um, so instead, I've shown you something that I find extraordinary. Lopez de Heredia is arguably one of the most, it's probably the most traditional bodega in, in Rioja. They use a lot of natural yeast. And then when the juice comes off the skins, they use this traditional method of passing it through bunches of sticks uh, in order to get the skins off. So how amazing is that? They don't filter up, you know, through anything at that point. They put it through sticks. Um, they also have a unique barrel size because they, they have a thicker barrel because they have extended aging and they want slow, long aging. They also have their own cooperage uh, and they don't filter and things like that, which is pretty cool. Um, I have I didn't put the full caves, but this is one of their old tasting rooms. Um, and I think they're about eight wines back or something crazy. So they have all these incredible old wines aging and um, very much uh, the traditional mantra of blend grapes, blend sites and store, you know, in barrel and then bottle, and you get the, the Rioja evolution. This is Muga. Muga, um, this is the old cooperage. I didn't put the barrels in, although those are barrels, but I've got some great pictures of them making barrels. But these are some of the tools that they used to use. I think they're a bit more high tech on some of them now, but they're very traditional in the old cooperage that's been handed down for generations because for them, oak and oak aging is at the center of their production. They also fine with egg whites. This is a beautiful old vat in Muga. Um, I won't go into fining too much, but essentially you put um, egg whites into the into your red wine. It, it removes the proteins by essentially binding with them. And then you remove that bound egg white at the end. So there's no egg left in your wine. It acts as an agent to remove the proteins, but they crack the eggs and sort them by hand. Um, right, that's what this little machine in front is for. So traditional. I've never, ever heard of anybody else doing this. Um, apparently not very cost effective, but it's a, a nod to the tradition and the style. So on the note of traditional, we've got our final wine, <clears throat> which I'm really excited about. Um, it, I think all four of these wines, <laughs> someone said, what happens to the yolk? The honest answer is, do you know why in port? Because this, so in port, they, this used to be a big thing with the production of port. Pastel de nata. Is anybody, if anybody has ever had a pastel de nata, it's an egg-based custard dessert. It comes from leftover egg whites. In Spain, tortilla. So they're usually egg yolk heavy rather than, um, than egg white heavy tortillas. So the ratio of extra egg whites would go into desserts or, or um, tortilla. So great question. <laughs> Glad I knew the answer. And yes, there must be a yolk in there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, let's go on to our final wine. So our exhibition Rioja Reserva is produced for us by La Rioja Alta. We also recently did have La Rioja Alta on to speak, and I will include their event uh, recording on the follow up email, too. Um, this is a lovely old bodega founded in 1890 by five families. It was a consortium group. Um, they're quite huge now, really. So 700 hectares, approximately. They have Alta, Alta as their main area, Alavesa, um, and then they have a little bit in the Baja. But but quantity wise, they predominantly in Alta and Alavesa. Um, at any given point, it's thought that Rioja Alta have about 45,000 barrels on the go in their cellar, and they carry around eight years worth of stock. So um, again, they do have some coopering in-house. Very sensible when you have that much oak knocking about. Um, this particular wine is the same as their Alberti wine. It is produced, Alberti, sorry, produced um, similar altitude to our last wine, 500, 600, something like that. Again, natural ferment, so similar to our last wine, 
But here they are using oak from Ohio. I think it's Ohio and Minnesota. Or is it Minnesota? Minnesota? Somewhere in America beginning with M that escapes me. But definitely Ohio. And two years. And one year is all of the wine in brand new oak. And for the second year, it's four-year-old oak. And then they leave it in bottle as well. They rack it, so they take it out of the barrels by candlelight. So they allow the sediment to, um, so they can see the sediment with the candlelight. So they don't use any sort of modern technology. And what I would say about this wine is if you are so interested, I'm gonna get this down now. Um, they have Ardanza, which is their grand reserve that they put their best grapes into from the region, um, or some of their best grapes, I should say. And on the years where Vino Ardanza doesn't get made, because the grapes aren't quite good enough for that, it comes into this. And so for £16, you can get um, a wine that has £25 value grapes in it. So um, Pierre taught me a good trick, our buyer for Spain. On a bad Rioja vintage, this is the best value wine. So there you go. You heard it here first. Um, but on the nose, it's oaky, it's toasty, it's vanillary, it's cinnamon, it's sweet spice, cardamom, all of those sorts of things. And that really is coming from the age. So if you do have the luxury of having both side by side, I do hope that you can tell the difference. It's naturally paler in colour as well. And that comes from the ageing in the oak. Um, it's going to have, have leached some of that colour, as has the racking and the barrels. So that racking will eventually strip some of the colour out as it comes out in the form of tannins. In terms of flavour, Mm. really spicy I find this incredibly spicy far less red um, far less black fruit far more red fruit um probably owing to some more garnacha in the blend although I can't guarantee that but I think so uh, no actually I don't think there is I think it is just the aging the fruit's more developed it's got that kind of red meaty notes to it I actually don't think there's any garnacha in this at all um it's beautiful, but it's very, very different. It's this kind of like white pepper spice, um, herbaceous, slightly meaty, um, really, really vastly different, but definitely the traditional Rioja that we're used to. So yes, I hope that was a good comparison. Um, right, I'm so conscious of time, we covered so much. In terms of rosé, it's not hard to explain the development of rosé over the years because really it's followed a global trend. Um, there are a lot of aged rosés in barrel in Rioja, which is quite rare compared to the rest of the world. So Lopez uh, de Heredia that I was just talking about with the sticks, they produce probably the richest, oldest rosé um, in the world. But there is a trend, as you would expect. So the fashionable trend towards those Provence styles is um, is emerging. But what I would say is Muga has said that um, Muga has said that they've always produced light styles of, of rosé. So it's not a new trend. It's just they're they're upping their game on what's more fashionable at the moment. Um, I'm conscious, really conscious of time because I do have to wrap up at eight o'clock. If I've missed any questions, please, please, please feel free to send them to me. Um, I, I'm happy to answer them tomorrow so you can email them in. Um, I'll just maybe answer one final question uh, from Sarah, who's, who's asked, does Rioja benefit from decanting? And the answer is sometimes, <laughs> which I know is an awful question. Those traditional styles are... Um, the traditional styles often can do with a little bit of oxygen. They need um, awakening. But sometimes when they're very old, you can decant them and they can fall off a cliff very quickly because they've already seen a lot of oxygen in those barrels. So my strong recommendation with Rioja, because it is a bit of a minefield when decanting, is if you can, see if there's any notes on the producer website. And if it's a small producer, I would email them directly. Um, I think the... I think the modern styles either often need decanting because remember some of those tannins are going to be a bit tighter because they haven't had the oak aging. So I would generally tend to um, tend to decant those. In fact, my El Pacto was much better two days later. It was much better today than it was on Tuesday. So I would decant those if you can. Um, but uh, to be honest, those are much better with food anyway. So I would I would always drink those with food. Uh, I've often heard that the best Riocas in the world are actually better after dinner. And I think that's a lovely thing. You know, the the re oh, I say the best, the really old aged ones are amazing after dinner rather than with food because you let them shine. And um, somebody in Rioja described it to me as uh, the best ones are like cognac. And I think that's beautiful. 
so I think that's a good point to end. Um, thank you all so much. Like I said, I will send a presentation. I'll send uh, notes. If you have any questions, please let me know. I know we we touched on modern and traditional the whole way through, but if you just have a burning question about what would you class this as modern or traditional? I like this wine. What do I like? More than happy to answer those questions as well. So I hope you have a fabulous evening. I'm excited to enjoy my carver. Uh, enjoy your night, everyone. If you've got four wines open like me, then I'm sure, I'm sure you will. Um, and hopefully we will see you soon. So cheers all. Thank you.